Hi Charles, on our assignment last week you said that you would like to read about chemical reactions and so I found a book just for you. The author of the book is Jenna Winterberg. This book was written in 2016 and the publisher is Teacher Materials Press. Chapter 1, Everyday Chemistry. When we think of chemistry, it's hard not to picture a lab with students wearing coats and goggles and using flasks and burners. But chemistry doesn't just happen in school. It regularly occurs all around us. Take breakfast, for example. Maybe you ate an egg or a piece of bread. Those foods are created through chemistry. And the way your body takes those foods and turns them into energy is another example of chemistry at work. In these cases, it's a chemical reaction. In other words, a change takes place that alters the material's makeup. The raw egg changes when it's scrambled or boiled. The food changes when your body digests it. Chemical reactions are such a normal part of our lives that we hardly note when they take place. We take for granted that when we put gas in our cars, it will fuel them. We don't think about science when we bake cookies or cakes, and chemistry is the last thing on our minds when we're warming ourselves by a wood-burning fire, watching fireworks up in the sky, or admiring the changing colors of autumn leaves. But without chemical reactions, none of these things would happen. Combining substances. Fresh cookies don't just appear out of thin air, don't we wish? You have to combine ingredients first before you bake them. For any chemical reaction, you need ingredients. In this case, we call them reactants because they are going to react to a chemical change. In baking, reactants are things such as sugar, eggs, and flour but they could be just about anything from oxygen or water to copper or salt. The simplest form of a reactant is an element. An element is a substance that contains only one kind of atom. For example, oxygen is an element. Water is made up of two kinds of elements, oxygen and hydrogen. When two or more elements bind together like this, the result is a compound. Compounds can be reactants too. There are far too many compounds to list them all, but the number of elements is limited. We make sense of them by way of a chart called the periodic table. The chart organizes the elements by atomic number. That's the number of protons in each atom. It also contains the atomic mass, the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Chemical reactions don't happen every time two substances combine. Sometimes the combinations simply form mixtures. In these cases, a physical change occurs, not chemical. A physical change can affect the way a substance looks, such as its size or shape or color. Sugar will dissolve in water. When combined, they form a type of mixture called a solution but the sugar and water have not changed chemically. In fact, they can still be separated. Plain cookie dough is another solution. You've mixed flour, sugar, butter, eggs, and other things to make the dough. This mixture would be difficult, but not impossible to separate. Still, no chemical change has taken place. All gas mixes are solutions. Take the air we breathe. It contains oxygen, sure, but it also has other elements, such as nitrogen and compounds such as carbon dioxide. There are a total of 15 gases in our air. Solutions are just one kind of mixture. They're homogeneous. In other words, all of the parts are evenly mixed and completely spread out. You can't see or tell one part from another. Your plain cookie dough is a homogeneous mixture, or homogeneous, you can say it either way. Other mixtures are heterogeneous. They contain a little more of one part than another. You can easily see the different parts of the mixture. If your cookie dough had pieces of chocolate, 
that you could see or even pick out, it would be heterogeneous. Down here by the honey pot, it says a sweet alternative. A colloid is a special mixture of a homogeneous mixture. It has larger particles than a solution, but they are still evenly spread out. This one says tricky mixing. A mixture can always be separated. If it can't, then a chemical reaction has taken place. Even solutions such as sugar dissolved in water can be separated. Simply boil the water until you are left with just the sugar. Sometimes it just takes a special tool. So think hard before you say that your mixer, mixture can't be reversed. Examining properties. When we combine substances, we want to know what changes. We get this data by observing and measuring. You might note that a mixture is pink in color. That's a good observation. But would it mean more if you knew the colors of the original substances? If they were white and red, pink is no surprise. But if they were white and blue, hmm, it's an exciting result. To make sense of mixtures, we need to understand individual parts first. That's why we measure and observe before and after. We look for a number of things when observing, but we always start with physical properties. These are things we can assess without altering a substance. Weight, volume, length, color, hardness, and smell are all physical properties. Magnetism is another example. So is the density of an object or how compact it is. We might even consider whether an object can conduct heat or electricity. The temperature at which a solid becomes liquid or its melting point is another physical property. So is boiling point, when liquid becomes gas. When water turns to ice, the phase change doesn't alter its chemistry. It's still hydrogen and oxygen, just colder and solid. And this chart shows different ways that you can think about those physical properties. Substances can also have chemical properties. These properties describe the substance's potential to react with something else. In other words, Chemical properties tell us if a substance could be a reactant. The chemical properties we might measure aren't standard. There isn't a set list that we check off. Rather, what we measure depends on what we want to study. Often our focus is on whether a material will react in response to acid, water, or air. Maybe we want to know if something is flammable. Will it burn when oxygen is present? Maybe we want to know just how flammable it is. How long will it burn? Perhaps we want to test if it will explode when ignited. We might like to see if an object will rust. Other times the question might be if it will turn into another substance. When observing physical properties, no changes are made to the substance. But in these examples, there is a risk of altering the original substance. It is the only way to test a substance's chemical properties. In all these cases, we are actually looking to see whether a chemical reaction will occur. This little box says chemical evidence, and it has something interesting to think about. Scientists examine chemical properties of evidence to solve crimes. They can use chemical properties to identify chemicals, poisons, or small bits of evidence left on the scene. Creating a product. Every chemical reaction will produce at least one new compound. This new substance is called the product. The product may be physically different from the original substance, and it is always in some way chemically changed. When two or more elements combine to form a compound, a chemical reaction takes place. For example, hydrogen and oxygen are two reactants that combine to form water. 
the compound is the product, which in this case would be water. It's quite different from the two gases that combine to form it. Compounds can also react to form a product. Take potassium iodide and lead nitrate. Both are compounds. Both are colorless liquids. Combined, they form a solid yellow substance called lead iodide. This new compound is the product of a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions aren't limited to the lab. When we boil a raw egg, it transforms. The egg is chemically changed. The boiled egg is a product and will never return to its previous composition. Likewise, when we place cookie dough in the oven, its chemical composition changes. The baked cookies taste and smell different from the dough. These are clues that a chemical change has taken place. Our product is freshly baked cookies. This green inset says, we use chemical reactions to make cars and rockets go. Rockets get their power from a chemical reaction that occurs when liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen are combined. This little inset that looks like it's on a phone says chemical shorthand. Scientists write out reactions in symbols. They're a little like math equations, but here the numbers become elements and compounds. First, reactants add together. Then an arrow leads to the result. For example, hydrogen plus another hydrogen plus oxygen equals water. Using chemical symbols, that equation looks like this. H2 plus O yields H2O, water. Turn page, there we go. We have to cook an egg to cause a chemical reaction. The same is true for cookies. In other words, we have to apply heat. Without heat, we would still have a raw egg and raw cookie dough. Heat doesn't have to be there for every chemical reaction to start, but some kind of energy needs to keep things going. Heat, light, and electricity can all kickstart chemical reactions. We refer to this as activation energy. Activation energy starts those electrons hopping. But electrons hold the atoms of the molecule together, and they can't do that if they're moving to different atoms. So, freeing the electrons means breaking the bonds between atoms. Doing so allows the electrons to form new bonds, and new bonds result in a new compound. Thus, activation energy enables a new product to form. Sometimes when atoms bind together, the bonds are very weak. For these bonds, not much energy is needed. The electrons start moving with very little help. For strong bonds, though, it takes a lot more activation energy to get things going. This box talks about ionic bonds. Atoms with only one electron in their outer layer are unstable. Unstable atoms trade electrons with each other to become stable. This is called an ionic bond. Up here it talks about covalent bonds. Atoms can also bond by overlapping their outer shells. Then they share electrons rather than trade them. This is called a covalent bond. Once started, chemical reactions can happen very fast. Take dynamite, for example. It will react with oxygen almost instantly, but that's only when there's plenty of oxygen around. Dynamite burns slowly when there is a lower concentration of oxygen. Particle size also changes reactivity. The smaller a particle is, the less time the reaction takes. takes. A powder version of a substance will react more quickly 
than a clump of the same material. Temperature can also affect reactivity too. Heat speeds reaction time. Iron forms rust when it meets oxygen, but iron isn't highly reactive, so this happens slowly over weeks or even years. Gas grills rust quickly though. That's because the iron gets hot when the grill is used. Iron coated with zinc will rust slowly. In this case, zinc acts as an inhibitor. This substance slows a reaction. It can even stop one. On the flip side, a catalyst speeds up a reaction. It does so by reducing the activation energy needed. Our bodies contain natural catalysts. For example, an enzyme in our saliva speeds up starch breakdown. This catalyst helps change the food that we eat into the energy that we can use. This little inset says, water must be present in the air for iron and oxygen to form rust. Hmm. This is a good lesson for Miss Olson. It explains what's happening to my garden gate. Cool catalysts. Catalysts can help to speed up a reaction. When a catalyst is added to a reactant, the energy increases. The higher energy in the reaction causes the molecules to work faster, producing the product much quicker. So here's the catalyst. The catalyst bonds to the reactants and the product is quickly released. Interesting inhibitors. Inhibitors slow and sometimes even stop chemical reactions. The catalyst, the inhibitor bonds to the catalyst. Reactants are blocked when they try to bond to the catalyst. Ah, that's why I'm putting a rust inhibitor on my garden gate before I repaint it. Categorizing reactions. Chemical reactions fall into six main types. Synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement, acid base, and combustion. Let's start with synthesis. The simplest type of reaction is synthesis. Here, two or more simple substances combine, and when they do so, they form a more complex compound as a result. You can combine the elements copper and sulfur using synthesis. When you do, they will form copper sulfide, and this compound is the product. Something to note happens here. Extra sulfur escapes as a gas. When hot sulfur hits the air, it reacts with oxygen. A poisonous gas is created as a result. That poison isn't a product of synthesis, it's the byproduct. A byproduct is a secondary product. It's a product that is a result of a side reaction. Every reaction can produce these kinds of byproducts. Luckily, not all of them are poisonous. Next, decomposition. So the opposite of synthesis is decomposition. In these reactions, a complex substance breaks down into simpler ones. The reaction separates a substance. For instance, you can break down water into its elements. All it takes is a push from an electric current. The water compound will be split into hydrogen and oxygen. The electric current separates the liquid. That process is called electrolysis, but not all decomposition occurs in this way. So now we've got a couple of examples. Chlorophyll camouflage. Plants make food with a form of synthesis called photosynthesis. They use sun, water, and carbon dioxide to synthesize chlorophyll. Chlorophyll gives leaves their green color. When the days shorten in the fall, plants make less food. Without chlorophyll present, we see the natural oranges and yellows of the leaves. Decomposition saves lives. Airbags in cars use decomposition to expand. They contain sodium, uh, uh, sorry, sodium azide pellets. When sodium azide is exposed to an electrical current, it decomposes to nitrogen gas and sodium. 
the nitrogen gas quickly expands and fills the airbag. Single displacement. Another type of reaction is single displacement. This is sometimes called a substitute reaction because one item takes the place of another. In these reactions, two substances compete to bond with another substance. For example, place an iron nail in a liquid solution of copper sulfate and watch what happens. The iron and copper compete to be part of the solution. The nail begins turning a pinkish brown color. That's because the copper is leaving the liquid compound. At the same time, the liquid turns from blue to pale green. The color change happens when the iron deposits where the copper was. Iron and copper sulfate become iron sulfate and copper. Double displacement. In a double displacement reaction, there's an exchange of partners. Here, two new compounds form. This means there are two products. Let's look at an example. If two couples are dancing together and they switch partners, this represents a double displacement reaction. Let's say Margot and Tom are dance partners. Lucy and Andrew are a pair. As the dance progresses, a switch is made. During this switch, Margot and Andrew become partners and Lucy and Tom become partners. This switch results in two new couples. Just like in double displacement, after the switch is made, new compounds are formed. Double the fun. Reading the box right here. You can amaze your friends and family with the help of a double displacement reaction. Just put baking soda into a container. Then add a little vinegar. Add food coloring for drama. Watch and enjoy the fizzy fun. This is the way we used to make volcanoes in science class when I was a kiddo. Acid base reaction. The baking soda in our cookies represents the base part of an acid base reaction. That's a special kind of double displacement. Atoms are usually neutral. They have as many electrons as they do protons. When an atom has extra or missing electrons, it becomes an ion. A substance with hydrogen ions is an acid. One with hydrogen ions is a base. Acids can be weak, like the citric acid that makes lemons tart. Or they can be strong, like the stomach acid that digests our food. Bases can also be weak, like baking soda, or strong like bleach. Bath soap is a weak base that results from combining a weak acid and a strong base. Shampoo is a weak acid that results from mixing a strong acid and a weak base. Hydrogen power. To measure the strength of bases and acids, we use the pH scale, where the pH stands for the power of hydrogen as in hydrogen and hydrogen ions. This scale ranges from zero, which is a strong acid, to 14, which is a strong base. Neutral substances, such as water, would rank about seven on this scale. Combustion. Combustion reactions sometime, excuse me, let me begin again, please. Combustion reactions combine a reactant with oxygen to produce energy. In other words, they burn. Combustion doesn't just burn wood in a fireplace to give off heat. These reactions allow us to fly to the moon. Rockets contain hydrogen gas. All it takes is a spark for hydrogen to react with oxygen. The two gases continue burning until one is gone. The energy that results is powerful enough to boost a rocket into space. And there's a flow chart that shows how the reaction works. World of chemistry. Chemistry 
doesn't just happen inside a lab and it doesn't have to be boring. Chemical reactions happen all the time. They are all around us, even inside us. We can thank acid-base reactions for providing us with both our soap and our shampoo. Synthesis creates the water that washes them away, leaving us clean. Double displacement gives us those fluffy pancakes we like to eat for breakfast, when we're lucky, that is. And decomposition allows us to turn that yummy breakfast into brain fuel. It's how we manage to stay alert all day at school. Enzymes in our mouths and stomachs act as catalysts. They help us quickly break down the food into energy and good thing too, because combustion engines make our cars zoom. We need lots of energies and we make our way. I mean, start that sentence again. I'm getting tired here. We need lots of energy as we make our way from home to school. Chemistry in the classroom can be just as exciting. After all, experiments are just another way to reveal the secrets of the substances that surround us. Observing physical and chemical properties in a lab prepares us to observe those same things in the real world because the real world is a world full of chemistry. And this little box suggests that you can try baking bread at home without baking soda to see what happens. Leaving different things out of the recipe yields different results. All right, there's some experiments for you to do. This one shows how to tell if a combination causes a chemical reaction. And there's a glossary and index. All right, Charles, I hope that you enjoyed that book about chemical reactions, and I hope to see you soon.